Welcome to the Physique Development Muscle Series. In this special series, we're breaking down the science and art of training each muscle group. Each episode is dedicated to a specific muscle, providing you with expert insight into its function, dispelling common training misconceptions, and highlighting our go-to exercises that deliver results. We'll also share key execution cues to help you perfect your technique and maximize your gains. Get ready to elevate your training game and achieve your fitness goals like never before. Let's dive into chest. Alex, the chest has been a long time goal for you to grow. How does it feel now after multiple years working on your chest growth? Still feel like I have a long journey ahead of me. (laughs) (laughs) Have made tremendous progress since I started. And uh, I feel as though, although I don't have the biggest chest in the world, the amount of progress that I have made makes me feel as though, as well as the amount of clients that I have helped do this, uh, makes me feel as though I have a lot of fun nuggets to to share for this episode. I can definitely confirm your chest growth, even from just the time that I've known you, has been wild to be able to see. And you used to regularly refer to your chest as having a bird chest. And I haven't heard you, I was about to say, I haven't heard you say that in a while. (laughs) But uh, within each muscle group, there's of course going to be an aesthetic side to it, which we'll always dive into because I know you and I enjoy that a ton. But I wanted to go ahead and talk about what the chest does. There are three main functions to the chest. The first is going to be flexion of the upper arm. The second is going to be adduction of the upper arm. And then it is going to be a rotation of the upper arm. And I think that it's important for us to talk about the insertion and the origin of the pec, of where that muscle is going to originate at and then where it is going to insert as we talk about the functions, because I do believe that that will allow for a greater understanding of how those functions really transpire. And so when we talk about the insertion, I'm sorry, the originating position for the pec, we're going to have some fibers along the clavicle um, or the the collarbone, as some will call it. And then we have uh, fibers that are originate on the sternum. And then we also have fibers that are going to originate on the upper portion of the the rib cage or the lower portion of that sternum as well. So they kind of spread across there. And then it is going to insert on the upper arm. And so this is how all that functionality is going to transpire of the flexion of that upper arm is simply just raising it in front of us. And then if we were to have our arm out to our side, adduction is going to be bringing that arm closer to our body. And then that rotation is simply just going to be slight rotation of the upper arm as well. That is extremely helpful. And if you didn't know, with this whole muscle group series, we will be having a little cheat sheet in the show notes. So if you need to visually see some of the things we're talking about, as I am a very visual learner, we'll have that so you can see where that origin and insertion parts are so that you can better understand this as we go along. Before we dive into more things when it comes to training, I did want to talk about what the chest is going to help with throughout the day because I think that that's really helpful for me as well is to understand how I'm using that muscle inside of training but also in my day-to-day life. And within your chest, you're using that to help you breathe and you're also using that for any type of pushing motion, whether that is pushing open a door or pushing your body off the ground or even if you're raising your hands up to wash your hair or put your hair up in a ponytail. And uh, for many of our listeners, like picking up your baby and like holding them out in front of you is going to be kind of this isometric contraction for your chest as well, or raising them above your head. Um, It could be to a degree involved with if you're in a pool with little ones and you're wanting to launch them or they're wanting to be (laughs) launched into the deep end of some sort, it'll be a contributing muscle group there as well. It's even included if you were to throw a punch, that would be, you know, using your chest in that. Very important. (laughs) Self-defense. You know, I've never thrown a punch, but at least I know my chest would be strong enough to make that happen. I think we should go, I mean, Miguel's here. We should take it just to boxing. Like Miguel can give us a class. Yeah. I think that'd be great. And then I can throw a punch. I can punch you at the end to see, (laughs) to test. Sure, I'll be the punching (laughs) bag all of a sudden. I feel like I should at least experience throwing a punch in practice before I have to do it in real life. Where are you wanting to punch me? I don't know. (laughs) Where would be best? I mean, maybe like my arm would probably be the best area. I don't want to get punched square in the face. (laughs) I'm not saying you're going to like smoke me, but I also just don't want to be punched in the face. You never know. 
I've got all this chest strength ready to go. Do I really, like on the flip side here, I don't know. I really don't think I could hit you. No, I, I don't think that you could. I, I'm way too soft or something, but I really don't no, think I could. No, I just think I'm like too pretty. That too. <laughs> so when it comes to that visual appearance, what are some of the things that people notice when it comes to the visual appearance? Man, visual appearance. If you're wanting to have the the opportunity to um, be just like broader across your across your chest, across your shoulders to make the illusion of your waist being smaller, the the chest growing from a, a male perspective is going to be a big help. Um, and it's also one of those muscle groups that it's very easy to see that someone has it right when you like meet them. Mm -hmm. As soon as you see that person, they've got, they've got a bigger chest. It could be a, a, a nice little like thumbs up for working out. You know, it's yeah. something that most people notice. They're going to notice your arms and they're going to generally notice your chest. Mm -hmm. um, it, whether that be someone who consistently works out or doesn't, those are generally the first two things that they notice. And I think a huge thing is going to be the posture because it does help with breathing and being able to keep you more upright. That That's going to be a huge aspect. And even just you talked about within males of being broader across the chest. Well, you can talk about some things within females, but it's something where it gives a nice bit of fullness to your upper body. And especially if you're able to work your upper chest, because you can have times where women end up training their delts and maybe they are also training um, their arms, but they're not training their chest much at all. And then there's just like the shallowness or um, there's like, it feels like it's concave a little yeah. bit because of that reason. Yeah. It's, it, it just takes away from the presentation overall. Mm -hmm. And so by having just a little bit of upper chest musculature is a big help to the overall presentation of your upper body for mm -hmm. female. And then for males, I mean, we talk about, and we'll get a little bit more into these different divisions here momentarily, but for, for males, we've got that upper portion that we're trying to, you know, basically just be oozing out of uh, <laughs> like a polo or a V-neck. Sure. You just want that to just be bussing out. It's a great mm -hmm. feature for you. Or a tank top. Like a that's a nice that's feeling. Another one. That, yeah. I know that's a feeling you really I love. I love that. Yeah. If I, I can, can nail tell that. when you're feeling yourself in a tank top, <laughs> rightfully so. Yeah. When it's just like you have that chest just fullness. A little bit of bump. Yeah. yeah. It gets a little you bit a of good, that booty chest. Yeah. yeah. Booty chest. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, density across your chest is going to be massive for overall visual aesthetics. I know a lot of women are scared to train chest and whether that's because they don't want to have these huge pecs or they just don't think it's an important muscle group to train. I think one thing I always like to mention is that when it comes to your chest and especially if you are a woman, that being able to have not only that upper chest fullness to help with your full upper body look, but it's something where the balance, if you're training your back all of the time and you don't have any chest volume, that can cause a lot of issues down the road for how your body functions. And I, of course, care about the aesthetic side of it, but I also care about how well my body can function. And so I think that they can go hand in hand without thinking that, oh, because I go ahead and I train chest, I'm going to now have these huge pec cutouts. Because one thing I always like to mention when people are afraid, oh, I'm going to get bulky, or what if I get these huge pecs, is that things like that don't happen by accident. And you have to be training regularly and very intently on that muscle group for that to happen. So you training chest every once in a while or having a maintenance volume in your training isn't going to cause you to have this huge chest split with these pecs that are then your boobs are sitting oddly <laughs> on top of them. That is going to be very difficult to achieve that look. Yeah. Well, I think that oftentimes when, when women may think about uh, training chest, they think of like a massive women's bodybuilder yeah. who has implants on top of mm -hmm. bigger pecs than some of the classic physique guys, for example. Yeah. So that's a, a hurdle that <laughs> I assure you doesn't come overnight. <laughs> And I know sometimes when it comes to training with implants, that's something that can be, um, I guess a lot of people might not have the knowledge of if they should, because I know that there are doctors that say that you shouldn't train chest at all after you've had breast implants. So how do you work around that? Well, I generally will err on the side of what their physician had 
advise them to do. I think that that's probably the best avenue first, but also explaining the downsides of not training chest and what they could be running into in the future from a functionality standpoint. And my experience with clients who have trained chest with implants and what their experience has been and um, what benefits they've experienced so that we can have more of a full picture view of exactly what all the possibilities are and what's on the table. Because I, I find that if you go into that situation and they've been told by their surgeon of like, do not train chest at all. And you are on the flip side saying, uh, no, your surgeon's an absolute idiot. Okay. <laughs> like I know way better than them and you should definitely train chest. That's just not a good environment to put your client into. Mm -hmm. And so at that time, it's much better to create open conversation and give different opportunities of understanding and experience so that they can make the most educated decision for themselves. And when they do go to their surgeon to say, hey, I'm actually training chest and it's going well, they have the reasons why that's the case relative to just being like, no, your surgeon's an idiot. You should train chest. And then she goes into her post-op and she's like, well, my trainer just told me to. It's like, yeah. this is not a fun experience for anybody. Mm -hmm. So allowing for them to have the knowledge and the understanding of the different factors and then them making the decision for themselves. And I, I do find that it is beneficial. Uh, you know, after all that, I'm like, <laughs> here's my opinion now, okay? <laughs> I do find it to be beneficial. It's not going to be something where we talk about the the different portions of the pec and you're going to have more of those sternal fibers and those costal fibers, the, the mid and lower fibers of the, the pec being behind or potentially in front of the implant, depending on how you're having it put in. But then you have that upper division of the pec that's not really being impacted a whole lot from the implant itself. You may have a little bit of discomfort as you go through retraction of the shoulders and protraction of the shoulders because of the implant or maybe any of the scar tissue that that could be around the implant itself. But we want to be able to work through a greater range of motion and train that upper chest so that you have overall balance to your chest as well, because I'm sure that there are women out there that see individuals with implants that may have, uh, I don't know what the verbiage is here of like not fallen down, but they're mm -hmm. just lower on their chest yeah. in general. And so then it looks a little off because they their implants are low and then they don't have much musculature or body fat up towards the upper portion of their chest. Mm -hmm. And then that kind of throws off their look. And mm -hmm. so if we can add a little bit of muscle tissue, and this is what you were speaking to, yeah. if we can add a little bit of muscle tissue, it gives that balance overall and uh, probably improves the overall presentation. A hundred percent. And it's something where within your chest, like I said, it's very much so involved in your breathing. And so being able to make sure, especially if you have implants, that you can have enough muscle to be able to pull up so you can breathe the correct way since it is also attached to your ribs, then that's going to be very helpful. It also stabilizes the shoulder joint um, and making sure that that's in a good spot. So there's a ton of benefits and it's just really being able to see how it needs to make sense for you. Because how you train chest is not going to be how right. I train chest because I don't have the same goals as you whatsoever when it comes to how I want my chest to look. But it doesn't mean that I should just throw chest training out altogether. Right. And I think that there have been also people that have experienced that they lose breast tissue as they are training. And I think one thing to note within that is it's often due to losing body fat than the fact that training your chest made your breast tissue smaller. Right. And I, that was something that happened to me is when I started training, I was losing fat. And so then I did lose some breast tissue size, but I also got more lift to my chest altogether, which was a nice little benefit little there. trade-off yeah, there. I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> Diving back into those divisions that you were talking about within the chest, what does it look like to bias those divisions within your training? So when we look at the different divisions, it's important to note that it's not so much that if I do a flat dumbbell bench press that it is only going to be targeting the sternal division or the costal division of my pec. It is going to be something where where the leverages are placed and the angles that are in place, that is going to have a greater percentage of time under tension probably to the different portion of the chest. And so they're all three contributing in some manner through small aspects of the range of motion, but there may be one because of how we set up the upper body, that one is going to have more time that it can travel and be under tension per se. Is there a favorite division that you like to train? Oh, man. Um, 
it, with the different divisions, the the costal uh, fibers, the lower division, this is often the one that many individuals have better overall development just organically through uh, flat dumbbell bench press or flat barbell bench press because of how their sternal sternal angle is. Um, I'm not in that camp. <laughs> I actually talked about this in a recent YouTube uh, vlog for the half marathon series is that I, like my chest and my sternum like go in at the last second. Like it almost feels like it's going back into my spine basically. <laughs> so for me to, to target those costal fibers, I have to be very well aligned in things like um, a a uh, high to low fly line up better for me personally than any of the pressing motions. So the costal pec is one that I've grown to really like recently because I've found movements that feel like I'm getting better tension to that particular division. Um, I also, I just like training chest in general. Now yeah. I'm just going to go down the list here, <laughs> but I, I do also like to train the, the clavicular fibers as well. Cause those are, both of those are challenging for me. Mm -hmm. Those sternal fibers, because they're the, probably the most abundant of the three are just easier for me to line up with and hit. So I enjoy it for sure. And I definitely feel the strongest there, but the place where I feel the most challenge or difficulty is through those costal or clavicular fibers. Yeah. It's funny because I've always enjoyed training upper body and I really enjoy training chest, even though I don't train it as much as you, I always get a kick out of it when I get to. And I really enjoy training those costal fibers and that high to low fly, just because it is a fun movement to really challenge yourself and push in to and it makes me feel really strong. And then I do also love those clavicular fibers just because I love the way that it adds to the aesthetic look of my body overall. Um, but I know that actually the first time that I decided that I was going to compete was when I was training my sternal fibers and I was doing a pec deck fly on it and a friend was taking a photo and I was like working on getting leaner and so I did start to have a chest split and she took a picture and she was like, you have to compete now because you are able to like achieve this. And I just thought it was so cool. I know the chest split is not every woman's desired look. And I'm not saying, again, it took a lot of hard work to get to that point. But it was something that I was very proud of in that moment of just being able to see my muscles working, see the development that I had worked so hard to to get. Absolutely. Well, it's a very interesting stamp of approval to compete in bikini. Yes. I'm like I have a <laughs> we chest had no split idea what we were talking about. <laughs> I have a chest split now, so I'm going to compete for sure. Yeah. Had no idea what we were talking about or what we were doing, but it felt like a I'm legit. Yeah, absolutely. Kind of big. <laughs> Attention all coaches, are you struggling with client adherence, retention, and motivation? And do your clients self-sabotage and lack the drive to succeed? We have the perfect solution for you. Starting August 8th, join Casey Joe and her expert team for The Coaching Code, a transformative and free three-part series designed to revolutionize your coaching approach and ensure lasting client results. Here's everything that you'll gain. In training one, it's all about the missing piece in nutrition and exercise certifications. You're going to discover the often overlooked elements that make coaching more effective and less frustrating. You're going to learn how to integrate these elements to streamline your coaching process. Going into training two is going to be all about communication strategies for behavior change. You will master the art of navigating challenging clients who frequently fall off the wagon. Equip yourself with specific actionable questions that boost client motivation and mindset. And rounding out at training three is the behavior change blueprint. You will uncover the four essential ingredients of effective coaching and ensure your clients stick to the plans and stop ghosting you. This series is a game changer. It's three powerful trainings, absolutely free, and designed to make you a better coach and your clients more successful. Don't miss out on this win, win, win opportunity. Secure your spot now and transform your coaching practice. Click the link in the show notes to register and let's elevate your coaching together. We talked about some of the movements and or divisions we like to train, but do you have any other go-tos that you like to program for clients? If our goal is to grow the chest, there's going to be a myriad of different opportunities here uh, within exercise selection. I will say for the vast majority, because of the, the variance to different 
machines that are available and there not being a ton that are uh, converging because that would be a really big part of being able to train the chest well through a machine is being able to have a converging um, handle of some sort. Uh, but I would say that the different dumbbell presses being huge. And then as they get to a place where the dumbbells are just more cumbersome to lift, mm -hmm. uh, to be able to handle for whatever rep range that we're implementing, utilizing the Smith machine can be a, an opportunity there. Uh, we do run into some issues where joint integrity can be a little bit more challenged relative to when we're using the dumbbells where we have full uh, flexibility or, or um ability to, what's the word I'm looking for? Not flexibility, but, um, you just have the, I mean, you do have the flexibility of where the weight can be moved and distributed. Okay. There's a better word there, but I'm <laughs> missing it. Um, so the, like a multi-grip bar where the handles are at a 45 degree angle, that's also a really good that. option. Yeah. I haven't used it in a while. I haven't I programmed know. it or I haven't had it programmed for myself in a minute. Um, but I like those at, as, as well. Mm-hmm. How about dips? Are dips something that you program for chest growth? So dips can be challenging because those are going to be targeted or the goal to target in that would be the like lower sternum fibers or those costal fibers and getting in alignment, your arm path in alignment to target those um, particular divisions can be challenging, especially if you are like pitching your feet back mm -hmm. and it is going to line up better with your feet in front of you. There's a, a banded version that I know in one education is kind of popularized to a degree, but that lines up the fibers better. But then the drawback to that is being able to load that over time. It gets a little bit cumbersome to get your feet secure in this band, but also have a, a plate, two plates or more mm -hmm. in between your legs while also trying to keep your feet stable on this band and then keeping everything aligned for the arm path to be there. So then that's where that uh, high to low fly or the high to low press more so with the cable and then anchoring yourself with more weight on the dip bar, but are on the, the dip belt. And then to anchor yourself down to the ground is uh, a much better option. Generally. I was going to ask, cause we've talked about different presses a lot. What does it look like within flies? Is that something that you commonly program? So this comes, uh, comes about, uh, in a, a little bit of a different way. I utilize a, a press around more often relative to the fly and, and let me kind of dig into why. And, and I do find that a visual representation for this would be better, but I don't have a whole lot of space here <laughs> to do that. So with the, the upper arm, and then we look at scapular movement being a big part of how the pec is going to lengthen and contract. And we, we need to see that scapula be able to kind of fan out as we're getting to a more contracted position. And then we need to be able to see that to retract as we get to a more lengthened position. So we want to see the shoulders be able to retract and we want to see a little bit of protraction. And so in a, a more press around where we're keeping the cable a little bit tighter to our frame, we can lengthen those fibers. And then as we are pressing around the body and passing our midline, whether that be to target the sternal fibers or that be to the costal or clavicular, we have a greater opportunity to fully shorten those particular muscle fibers. If we're utilizing a pec fly and we have the cables out away from us, very far away from us, we may get greater shoulder involvement, but we're also not going to get the pec fully shortened because we're going to run our hands into one another. And so if you wanted to use the cable uh, or a pec deck machine, you could do that, but doing it single arm may be a better variation for you to accomplish the goal of what a fly really is meant to do of getting the pec in the fully shortened position. I feel like even without the visual, you did a good job of okay, explaining thank you. that. Yes. Uh, is there a preference that you have when it comes to using dumbbells or free weights or using machines or cables when it comes to training chest? It really is going to be dependent on the person and what is available to them. I think that that's the biggest thing to really drive home because too often people listen to these sound bits and they're like, okay, well, they said that dumbbells are the absolute best. Well, I have the best gym on the planet and I have all these amazing pieces of machine that I could use. It's like, well, if you have that, then you got all the tools possible, but you can get a lot done with dumbbells. And then you can also get a lot done with a barbell, but you just have to be cognizant of some of the drawbacks that you may experience with having only the barbell for your presses. And that being something where your elbows may be a little bit more challenged. You may be experiencing a little bit more joint pain, uh, may need to pull back on the overall volume to, to keep up with the pressing that you have. Um, just being cognizant of those things. But if I was to have a 
preference for myself. I think that there are mm, some machines that are nice. <laughs> and then I probably would err more on the side of a lot of the dumbbells and then some of the cable variations to where you're able to set yourself up and, and utilize those. That was going to be my next question. If some of you guys don't know, we do have a home gym. And if you were able to add a chest piece, because we do not have any chest machines, what would that be? Or you can have two or three options if you have them, but. So uh, Nautilus, I, they don't sell this anymore, but there was a Nautilus plate loaded, uh, like horizontal chest piece. You'd be sitting vertically and then the weight would be behind you and you'd be able to press this way and it would slightly converge. It was a, an amazing piece of equipment. Now they have one that is pin loaded that's decent, but nothing really compares to that first one that was plate loaded. Um, so I love that piece. Um I'm trying to, I feel like that's really the only one that I would want to have. Is there one that comes to mind for you that I've um, said before? I think about the the prime one that is plate loaded and then it has the, um, I know they have the extreme row, which is obviously for back, but they have the plate loaded, which looks very similar for chest and the different positions to be able to put in. And I feel like it does converge. I think there was one at KG. Yeah. I haven't used that piece in a while. Um, I probably would like it. Mm -hmm. I, I'd have to play with it again to be like 100% taking up the very minimal space in my yeah. gym or in the garage. If I had all the space in the world. Absolutely. Let yeah. me, and if I want to use it <laughs> once it a month or whatever, yeah, <laughs> put it in there. But um, off the top of my head, that Nautilus one would be a, an easy sub because in my mind, we only have really two slots in the gym that are available. Like I can move out the um, horizontal hammer strength row mm -hmm. and then we could replace the leg extension and the leg curl to be a combo piece. So then that opens up another slot. So then that gives me two. Um, and I've thought about this number of times. I've got a lot of different <laughs> equipment that could go in there. That Nautilus chest press piece and then a um, at Atlantis pendulum squat is the first oh, thing that's on my you list. you would love to oh, have I, a pendulum golly, squat. Golly, <laughs> I would be so happy. Oh my goodness. Uh, so when it comes to training, I know we talked about things of making sure that you do have that conversion, but are there any mistakes that you commonly see when people are training, whether it's from the exercise execution videos that people send or just things you see out in the wild? The number one mistake that I see is people locking down their shoulders. Mm -hmm. And so they get into the bench and they wiggle their way and they're like, okay, I'm pulled all the way back and I'm going to stay here the entire time. Not fully understanding the function of the pec. Now, is retraction a very important part of a press? Certainly. I mean, it's literally every bit of half of the movement as you are allowing the bar or dumbbells to come closer to your chest as you're lowering the weight. But if we have, as we press the weight, our shoulder needs to move. Mm -hmm. And if we're in a place where we are locking down the scapula and really pinning down our shoulders, we have to understand that the scapula and the upper arm, the humerus, is a ball and socket joint. And so if we are trying to keep our scapula pinned down as low as and as hard as we can, as we try to press and get that weight further away from us and contract our pec, what do you think is happening to the head of that humerus? And what do you think is happening to that scapula? Do you think that there is separation? Is there maybe some greater stress on the um, rotator cuff and the ligaments that are surrounding that? I would say so because you're still trying to force that humerus to keep driving up and to continue to extend at the elbow, but continuing to have that scapula trying to stay in the same spot. Now, for your overall safety, I imagine that your body is allowing for some movement to that scapula. You're not going to be able to keep it pinned the entire time, but that's probably some of that sensation or, or pain um, that people are experiencing and kind of labeling it as, well, I'm getting more tension. And it's more of your body being like, bro, mm -hmm. this is not where we want to be. This is feedback that we need to kind of figure things out. And so we're going to have the, we want the, the shoulders to be able to move freely throughout a, a pressing motion. Um, it's not so much that we're just like, up shrugged like this and we're, you know, doing like we're having some stability and, and bracing, but we want to have fluent motion th for the scapula and the upper arm to be able to move to allow for the pec to fully lengthen and to shorten as much as it can, depending on what the movement is. And so that is the number one error mm -hmm. that I see <laughs> on a very regular basis. And as I correct that with clients, it is like a massive light bulb for them. Mm -hmm. Now it takes time yeah. because we have, we have trained the body and the mind to be in this place where these small muscle groups around the scapula are, are being told to function as some of these larger muscle groups. And you see some of the like scapular winging and those different things transpire from this Q1 
cueing coming into play. And so when we kind of break through that and work through some different drills to get them into a better position, it's like a, a massive light bulb, but also their, their chest as well as their pressing motions improve dramatically in a very short period of time. I can confirm because this was me and it was something where I was feeling like I wasn't actually getting tension on the chest and I was having a lot of shoulder pain when I was training. And that was a deterrent to train because who wants to be in pain when you're training? And then I just felt kind of like jacked up throughout the day and it went on for a while until um, I met you, basically, and you were able to say, hey, you're supposed to let that move. And it's been so helpful time and time again to be reminded to learn about the muscle in and it of itself. And I'm not going to sit here and act like I know everything about every exact origin and insertion point of every muscle and I can name all the specifics of it. But I know enough to be able to understand how the muscle needs to move to get the most benefit. And that's my biggest thing is I don't want to be spinning my wheels. I don't want to be training hard and getting no benefit of it. That sounds ridiculous. And so the more that I can understand how how the body moves, then I can better train and see better results in a better time frame, like you said. And so really being able to see of, okay, this doesn't need to be locked down. I can have fluidity within this and also understand what it looks like to truly have tension on my chest. And that's one of the questions I ask clients. If they send a video and it's of chest training and I see that their scapula or it looks like their scapula are locked down, one of the first things I'll say is where do you feel the tension? when you're performing this exercise or where do you feel this exercise? And when they say, oh, I'm, I'm kind of just feeling some like some frustration in my shoulders, then we're able to talk through that and really be able to then transfer to how can we feel tension on the chest? Right. The second air that I commonly see is going to be like elbow positioning or upper arm positioning in presses. And this is not something that we have to be like pinned to our, our sides with our upper arm, but we do want to be a little bit closer to our sides relative to as far away as possible, making more of a T. We want to be somewhere in that 45 degree window. And this is going to allow for us to better retract through our shoulders, because if I'm out here, it's a little bit harder for me to work through that retraction. If I'm here, I'm able to really pull those shoulder blades together and lengthen my chest. And then I'm also able to be in a stronger position to utilize my chest to get into a more contracted position. And there, as we're pressing, we're going to have a slight degree of, of protraction of the shoulders. Not like I'm like this, yeah. but it's going to be something where there's a slight degree as I pull my upper arm across my chest to finish the repetition. And so that's something to keep in mind. If you're finding yourself in a place, and you may see this as you're uh, watching a video back as you are going through a press, and maybe you're getting closer to failure, it's very easy for us to immediately just kind of flare our elbows because we're going to get greater recruitment from the anterior delt. Now, in your mind, you're thinking, why in the world would I try and recruit a smaller muscle group um, to a movement that's requiring a larger muscle group? It's just mechanics of potentially what we've done over the long haul previously. And so it's kind of like a, I don't want to call it a protective mechanism, but it's just like leaning into old habits when we are trying to finish a rep or, or get into a place where the chest is more fatigued. Yeah. And I would say one of the other mistakes that I see commonly is just going to be the setup of the movement. So being in a place where joints aren't aligned when you're going through it. And that's one thing where, again, if you are like, well, I don't understand all of the divisions. I don't understand what each each exercise is going to train all of those divisions. Logically, what I want you to think about is just are my joints aligned as I'm going through this movement? So let's take something like you're doing some sort of press on a cable. And if you're in a place where the cable is now above your shoulder and not going through any of the joints down your arm, then it's likely not going to be aligned and the tension is not going to go where let's you want it a, to go. Let's use a dumbbell as a better example because I think the cable can get a little funky depending okay. on where it's coming from per mm -hmm. se. So like for a... a dumbbell, we would have at the top of a press, we'd want our wrist and our elbow and our shoulder to all be aligned. Mm -hmm. Where some people run into the issue, as they lower the weight, they may be at a 45 degree angle with their elbow, but then they're fully pronated. And for pronation, if I am laying on a bench, the back of my hand is the thing that I see the most from my point of view. Mm -hmm. What we would want to see is more of the... Um, 
this is why a visual is better. The the head of the dumbbell, I suppose, yeah. like the center point of the dumbbell and more of our thumb being something if the dumbbell was to not exist and we just had the handle from the dumbbell, we would be able to see our thumb. And that allows for our wrist, our elbow, and our shoulder to maintain that alignment throughout the entirety of the press and limiting any of the ligament or tendon stress that we could be placing on some of those uh, smaller things. I did want to give a quick tip when training chest. And it's something, especially if you're doing some sort of pressing movement with a dumbbell or a barbell, of really being able to use your feet to help give you power. And not only can you use like your knees to help kick up the weight when it gets heavier, and especially if you don't have a spot, but I see a lot of times in exercise videos that people are tapping their feet or they're moving their feet around. But if you're really able to stabilize your feet and press them into the ground, still keep Keeping your butt or your glutes against the bench, you do not want to lift those up, then that can give you a lot of power to really push through your chest instead of kind of cutting yourself off at the waist and really just trying to go from there. Yeah. Very important to just create the most stability possible. Mm -hmm. Are you sick and tired of your glutes not growing? turning around in the mirror and seeing a board for a booty. I've been coaching for nearly a decade, helping thousands of women reach their goals. The most common goal, grow my glutes. Women in their 30s, 40s, 50s, and even 60s, able to grow their glutes with the guidance of my training programs. And for all this time, I've kept my best glute growth secrets only for my one-on-one -on -one clients. And that changes today. We just released our 12-week glute growth program in the PD training app. It is a four-day program with exercise and volume adjustments every three weeks. You can easily access the program through our app and track every single workout. Each exercise will have a detailed video teaching you exactly how to perform each and every movement. And guess what? I am no longer gatekeeping. I'm sharing every single one of my best glute growth secrets inside this program because you are awesome and I want you to have this program. I'm going to give you $25 off, making it a fraction of what you spent at Starbucks this past month. Use code POD. The link to purchase will be in the description. Now let's get back to the show. When it comes to going into the pressing movements and specifically within something like dumbbells, is the goal to get the dumbbells to touch together? It is not. I think that that's a common error that many people run into is that they're trying to clank them together as well as it, I think, throws off a lot of people when they do make contact mm -hmm. and they're able to clank and then they're like, oh my gosh, and then come back down and they clank. <laughs> and oh my gosh. There. <laughs> yeah. And so a, a better cue there would be to drive the biceps together because as we've talked about, the pec is going to attach on that upper arm or on the humerus. And so if we're trying to get the insertion and the origin as far away from one another as possible, and then trying to get them back together as close as possible, dictating our movement or what we're trying to bring together, being more of the, the bicep or that upper arm is a much better idea than trying to bring the dumbbells together. And oftentimes what happens when people are trying to bring the dumbbells together is that they're going to over protract through the press. And then it's going to be something where they are having a lot more tension to their shoulders and maybe creating a little bit of discomfort as a whole. So having that cue of pushing the biceps together is much better. Yes, I use that cue a lot with myself and with clients just because it's great to have that visual to really think about those biceps because I think that the dumbbells together is just a good signaling for people to like the end of the movement. And so really being able to think of it of I'm trying to lengthen and then shorten the, mu uh, the muscle instead of I'm just trying to bring the dumbbells from point A to point B is a great way to think about it. Bingo. Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes to training volume, are there different considerations you need to take of how frequent to train chest or what does that look like? I would say this comes down to your goals, right? If, if you have very specific goals of, man, I've really developed my lower chest and I've had a lot of the costal fibers are really dense and the sternal fibers, but then it just looks like my clavicle is just hanging out up there by itself <laughs> and you are needing to better bias that area, then maybe you split the volume into a place of like, this is going to be more of my sternal, this is going to be more of my costal, this is going to be more of my clavicular fibers. But I would say for a majority of individuals, just having a base of this is the amount of sets that I'm doing for chest per week is advantageous. Now, when we talk about the total amount of sets that are being performed, it depends on 
what those exercises look like. If I'm to say to do 10 to 12 total sets for chest, and those 10 to 12 sets are all dumbbell presses, my fatigue from those particular exercises is going to be much higher because uh, the, the muscular demand as well as the muscle being targeted more in the lengthened position. So I'm gonna have a little bit of greater challenge on that side. But if I had something where I was doing just press arounds and really focusing on getting my pec fully shortened, that's going to have a different fatigue level for the muscle as well. So it's hard to give like a, a hard steadfast place, but I would encourage getting a, an idea and just setting a, a basis. We can say 10 to 12 for now and see how you respond to that volume. Are you extremely sore? Are you in a place where you're recovering from the exercises that you selected uh, to perform? Maybe you split those into two days. I would probably say that splitting, if you're doing 10 to 12 uh, sets for chest, maybe splitting that into two sessions is a better option for you because let's say you do all 10 to 12 sets in one session, you may find find yourself in a place where six of those sets are really productive and you're able to get to a close threshold of failure. But then the latter six sets are in a place where you're dealing with so much fatigue from the first six that it's like, these are kind of like not the best overall reps and you're kind of going through the motions. If you find yourself in that place where you are still doing just more volume, but they're not as quality as the first half per se, just split it into a second session and you're going to get more bang for your buck and probably have better results because of it. So are you ready to go into some questions that I think so. the viewers had? Okay. All right. You have mentioned before that you thought it was silly that you didn't train chess when you were playing baseball. How would training chess help athletes? Oh my gosh. Um, so with me not training chess in the past, it was because I was doing the rigid lockdown and like forcing myself. So I was constantly having shoulder pain and I had torn my rotator cuff in high school. So then once I tore my rotator cuff, then everyone was like, don't do anything for your chest. Just like strengthen your shoulder and then don't worry about your chest at all. So then I didn't really do any pressing motions for a while, not even like an overhead press because everyone was bugging out about it. So it would be tremendously advantageous for all athletes, depending on well, I say all athletes, then it depends on what's, what's their sport. Yeah. You think of someone like a an offensive lineman or a defensive lineman, anyone who's more in the trenches of blocking or what have you in football, extremely important, as well as for a, um, for a quarterback, for example, they're having to really strengthen their upper back, their lats, their legs, everything is needing to be cohesive. So I would say it's important for all athletes. Mm-hmm. Is it okay to arch your back while training chest? I think it's all right to, to arch your back. I, I think there's a point of diminishing returns where you're doing so much arching that you've got your scapula so pinned down and your shoulders so pinned down that you're not able to do a whole lot of um, actual pressing. But especially from a powerlifting perspective, if you're trying to shorten the range of motion uh, for you to be able to accomplish the rep, then it's a, a viable option there. I think one of the biggest things with arching is make sure that that butt stays on the bench. Sure, yeah. <laughs> uh, when you're spotting someone, should you spot them by their elbow or their wrist? So I was always taught growing up to spot them on their wrist. And I still, to this day, feel probably the most comfortable, if I'm comfortable with the person I'm spotting, uh, to get them on their wrist. But then some individuals prefer to have the spot on their elbows. And my concern with spotting someone on their elbows is that if you, if they're doing a press and you are pushing them up under their elbows, if they don't have the stability or the strength, and then they start to, instead of pressing up with you, they start to push more towards their chest and mm -hmm. those dumbbells fall in. That's always my concern there. Yeah. And so that's something, if I'm at a gym and someone comes up to me and says, hey, can you give me a spot? I'm always asking this list of questions. Keep this in mind. Where do you want my hands? Do you want me to grab it or are you willing to die with this weight? <laughs> and then how many reps are you going for? Have you gotten this weight before? And then um, I'm here with you. And like, just be very attentive when you're spotting that person. So ask those questions and then be able to, to create clarity. I prefer the wrist because it's just a much more stable position and I'm able to provide a lot of support on the wrist. Now, if I have someone who is pressing 120, 130 pound dumbbells, 
it's going to be tough for me to get up into their wrist to give them a spot. So I'm generally just going to be under the elbow. So it is going to also depend on what that person is is doing. And I think a big thing within spotting is making sure that you're keeping the pace of the lifter instead of like trying to rush them or slow them down, keep with their pace and try to match that as you are giving them support. Yeah. Well, that's more specific to hypertrophy. If someone was to be like powerlifting and trying to get a clean rep, you want to be there as close as possible and then let them, you know, tell you to take it or what have you. But in, in the sense of like, I'm improving body composition, maintaining the pace is going to be really important. And then also not taking the weight away from them right away. Yeah. Just giving them enough support to keep momentum and movement going rather than being like, oh, you failed. Yank. Yeah. It's like, you're going to really irritate a lot of people doing that. <laughs> I feel like you do a great job of that, of you still encourage me to push myself while giving me the little bit of support I need to complete what I'm doing. Yeah. And, and a lot of people have more repetitions than just one if you're going to give them a little bit of a nudge. Mm -hmm. Like if you're going to continue to support them and give that extra bit of, of effort for them, they could maybe get three extra reps beyond what they would have if you didn't spot them. So having a great spotter is an excellent way to train near or even past failure if that was the goal. Mm -hmm. Can you build a big chest with just push-ups? Do you have weight? Just push-ups. <laughs> At some point, you're going to be at a place where continuing to see progress or, or uh, muscle fiber density improvement is no longer possible. But for someone who is just starting out and um, is needing to build their strength to their chest, I would say that there's a good starting point, like ramping up the push-ups, improving overall endurance, getting close to failure um, is probably a viable option. Mm -hmm. How many exercises is ideal to grow my chest? Like per session? Sure. <laughs> um, I would say you can get a lot done with three exercises in a session. Mm -hmm. I would say that that's probably sufficient for you to be able to have a really challenging load-bearing movement um, that's lengthened. And then you have maybe another lengthened bias exercise. Maybe you have something that's like sternal and costal biased. And then you have something that's more clavicular biased. And then maybe you have something that's uh, more shortened bias. And that would be a good three exercises for that session. Um, beyond that, you may be in a place where, again, the fatigue from those three movements is already, especially if you're getting close to failure on, let's say you do three or four sets of each of those exercises, you do four sets of each of those, that's already 12 total yeah. sets. Beyond that, it's just going to be something where you may not need it. It's honestly pretty difficult to do four exercises for one muscle group within oh, yeah. a session at yeah. all. I think three honestly should be the cap. Like mm -hmm. three, if you do the three movements well and you really challenge yourself with the weight, three is probably enough. Mm -hmm. And can I train my chest every day? Um, I would encourage you probably not uh, because it's just going to be something where, especially with the weight that you're utilizing and those different factors, you need time to recover. It's very unlikely that you're going to be able to nail the volume and intensity perfectly every day to where in 24 hours time frame that muscle is ready to be trained again and has recovered from what they just did. So I would say at minimum having 48 hours in between the sessions um, and probably a better situation being 72 hours of like between two really, really great sessions. Mm -hmm. How many times can I train chest in a week? I would say twice is is solid. You may be able to push it into a third depending on how you break down the volume. Like if you were to go into a situation where, uh, and I know that I've done this with uh, clients of mine, is that if it's a full body training, like they are able to train chest all three days, but they may only have three or four sets of chest on those days um, that they're training. So they're able to get a lot of bang for their buck when they are training the chest in that day. Um, but it's not so much fatigue that they're struggling to be recovered by the next time that they hit that tissue. Yeah, I think that's a great point because if you're listening to this and you're thinking, well, I do train full body, so I train my chest multiple days a week. I think that we're also focusing on if you're having like a chest day, I'm doing these three for exercises for my chest, then that's going to be a little bit different when it comes to your recovery as a whole. Absolutely. Do you have any other notes, comments, questions, concerns when it comes to chest? 
I don't think so. I feel like we touched on a lot when it comes to to chest training today. Yeah. Don't forget to grab your cheat sheet because on that cheat sheet is also going to be a playlist of all of our favorite chest exercises and walking through how to perform them. So if you are just listening to this and don't have that visual, being able to watch those videos is going to be a huge help. And we're just very excited to continue this muscle series with you. So we'll catch you in the next one. Make sure you share it with a friend.